Well, welcome everyone. It's lovely to be with you all. We are in uh, the book of Deuteronomy. Um, Moses has uh, gathered the entire Israelite people right there as they're about to cross over into the, the promised land. And he is now he is now recounting for them uh, this uh, this journey that as a people they've been on this Exodus journey. So we are in uh, the second portion in the book of Deuteronomy, Parshat Ba'et Hanan, which is in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter three, beginning with verse 23. We'll read through the English translation of our portion. I'll share with you a focused study about it, and then we'll have our collaborative conversation about it. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead and unmute so we can together have an opportunity to recite our blessing for this opportunity of studying Torah together, oh, please feel free to do so and we share in this blessing. Maru Thank you, God, for the opportunity to immerse ourselves in words, deeds, and relationships of Torah. I'll share with you the opening verses, and then I'll invite others to have an opportunity to, to read as well. Once again, we're in chapter 3, beginning in verse 23. I pleaded with God at the time, saying, Oh, Adonai God, you who let your servants see the first works of your greatness and your mighty hand, you whose powerful deeds no God in heaven or on earth can equal, let me, I pray, cross over and see the good land on the other side of the Jordan, that good hill country and the Lebanon. But God was wrathful with me on your account and would not listen to me. God said to me, enough, never speak to me of this matter again. Go up to the summit of Pisgah and gaze about to the west, the north, the south, and the east. Look at it well, for you shall not go across yonder Jordan. Give Joshua his instructions and imbue him with strength and courage, for he shall go across at the head of this people and he shall allot to them the land that you may only see. Meanwhile, we stayed on in the valley near Beth Peor. Margo, do, would you like to read a little bit at the very beginning of chapter four? And, uh, thank you. And now, uh, and now, O Israel, give heed to the laws and rules that I am instructing you to observe so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add anything to what I command you or take anything away, away from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I enjoin upon you. You saw with your own eyes what the Lord did in the matter of the Baal Peor, that the Lord your God wiped out from among you every person who followed Baal Peor. And uh, while you who held fast to the Lord's command, uh, to the Lord your God, are all still alive today. Thank you, Margo. Let me invite Norm. Would you like to pick up there at verse five? And got to got to turn on the audio. OK, go. verse five. See, I have imparted to you laws and rules as my God Adonai has commanded me for you to abide by in the land that you were about to enter and occupy. Observe them faithfully, for that will be proof of your wisdom and discernment to other peoples who on hearing of all these laws will say, surely that great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what great nation is there that has a God so close at hand as is our God Adonai, wherever we call, when, whenever we call? Or what great nation has laws and rules as perfect as all this teaching that I set before you this day? But take utmost care and watch yourself scrupulously so that you do not forget the things that you saw with your own eyes and that's so that they do not fade from your mind as long as you live and make them known to your children and to your children's children. 
the day you stood before your God, Adonai, at Horeb, when Adonai said to me, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words in order that they may learn to revere me as long as they live on earth and may so teach their children. You came forward and stood at the foot of the mountain. The mountain was ablaze with flames to the very skies, dark with densest clouds. And when I spoke to you out of the fire, you heard the sound of words, but perceived no shape, nothing but a voice. God declared to you the covenant that you are, were commanded to observe, the Ten Commandments, inscribing them on two tablets of stone. At the same time, Adonai commanded me to impart to you laws and rules for you to observe in the land that you were about to cross over and occupy. Thank you so much. Mark Levenstein, would you like to read a little bit starting at verse 15? Thank you, sir. <clears throat> for your own sake, therefore, be most careful, since you saw no shape when the Lord your God spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire not to act wickedly and make for yourselves a sculptured image in any likeness, whatever the form of a man or a woman, in the form of any beast on earth, the form of any winged bird that flies in the sky, the form of anything that creeps on the ground, the form of any fish that is in the waters below the earth. <clears throat> when you look up to the sky and behold the sun and the moon and the stars, the whole heavenly host, you must not be lured into bowing down to them or serving them, these Adonai allotted to the other peoples everywhere under heaven. But you, Adonai, took and brought out of Egypt that iron blast furnace to be his very own people, as is now the case. Now Adonai was angry with me on your account and swore that I should not cross the Jordan and enter the good land that the Lord your God is assigning to you as a heritage. For I must die in this land. I shall not cross the Jordan but you will cross and take possession of that good land. Take care then not to forget the covenant that Adonai your God concluded with you and not to make for yourselves a sculptured image of any likeness against the Lord your God as enjoined you. For the Lord your God is consuming fire and impassioned God. Thank you, Mark. And Jim, would you like to continue there at verse 25? Uh, Jim, we're having some audio problems. So uh, let me skip over to Steve. Uh, and maybe you can work on that. And Steve, would you like to continue there at verse 25? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. Verse 25. When you have begotten children and children's children and are long established in the land, you should, should you act wickedly and make for yourselves a sculpted sculptured image in any likeness causing the Lord your God displeasure and vexation, I call heaven and earth this day to witness against you that you shall soon perish from the land that you are crossing in the Jordan to possess. You shall not long endure it, but shall be utterly wiped out. Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and only a scant few of you shall be left among the nations to which the Lord will drive you. There you will serve man-made gods of wood and stone that cannot see or hear or eat or smell. But if you search there for the Lord your God, you will find him, if only you seek him with all your heart and soul. When you are in distress because all the things have befallen you, and in the end return to the Lord your God and obey him, for the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you, nor will he let you perish. He will not forget the covenant which he made on oath with your fathers. Thank you, Steve. Rose, hi. Would you like to continue there? We're at verse 32. Chapter yes. Yes, thank you, Rabbi. You have but to inquire about bygone ages that came before you, ever since Hashem created humankind on earth. From one end of heaven to the other, has anything as grand as this ever happened? Or has it has its like ever been known? Has any people heard the voice of a God speaking out of a fire as you have and survived? 
Or has any deity ventured to go and take one nation from the midst of another by prodigious acts, by signs and portents, by war and by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and awesome power as uh, your God Hashem did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? It has been clearly demonstrated to you that Hashem alone is God. There is none else. From the heavens, Hashem let you hear the divine voice to discipline you on earth. Hashem let you see the great divine fire, and from amidst that fire, you heard God's words. And having loved your ancestors, God chose their heirs after them. God personally, in great divine might, led you out of Egypt to drive from your path nations greater and more populous than you, to take you into their land and assign it to you as a heritage, as is still the case. Know, for this, know therefore this day and keep in mind that Hashem alone is God in heaven above and on earth below. There is no other. Observe God's laws and commandments, which I enjoin upon you this day, that it may go well with you and your children after you, and that you may long remain in the land that your God Hashem is assigning to you for all time. Then Moses set aside three cities on the east side of the Jordan to which a man who has killed someone could escape, one who unwittingly slew another without having been an enemy in the past. He could flee to one of these cities and live. Bezer in the wilderness and the tableland belonging to Rubenites, Ramoth and Gilead belonging to Godites, and Golan Bashan belonging to the Manassites. Thank you so much, Ruth. Uh, Mark Thompson, would you like to continue there at verse 44? Yes, thank you. This is the teaching that Moses set before the Israelites. These are the decrees, laws, and rules that Moses addressed to the people of Israel after they had left Egypt, beyond the Jordan, in the valley of Beth Peor, in the land of King Sihon of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, whom Moses and the Israelites defeated after, after they had left Egypt. They had taken possession of his country and that of King Og of Bashan, the two kings of the Amorites, which were on the east side of the Jordan, from Aror on the banks of the Wadi Arnon, as far as Mount Sion, that is Hermon. Also, the whole Arabah on the east side of the Jordan, as far as the Sea of, of the Arabah, at the foot of the slopes of Pisgah. Thank you. Mark, why don't you continue a little bit more if, if you're up for, uh, into chapter five? five? Moses summoned all the Israelites and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the laws and rules that I proclaim to you this day. Study them and observe them faithfully. The Lord our God made a covenant, covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, the living, every one of us who is here today. <clears throat> face to face, the Lord spoke to you on the mountain out of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to convey the Lord's words to you, for you were afraid of the fire and did not go up the mountain, saying, I, the Lord, am your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods beside me. You shall not make for yourself a sculptured image, any likeness of what is in the heavens above or in the earth below or in the waters below the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, are an impassioned God, visiting the guilt of the parents upon the children, upon the third, upon the fourth generations of those who reject me, but showing kindness to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not swear falsely by the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not clear will not clear one who swears falsely by his name 
Thank you so much, Mark. R Robert, would you like to continue there at verse 12? Yes, thank you. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, that, that thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy maidservant, nor, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, neither shalt thou commit adultery, neither shalt thou steal, neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor, neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, Neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Thank you so much, Robert. And Jay, would you like to continue there, verse 19? Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, you said 19? Yes. I don't, I don't know. I spoke these words those words and no more to your whole congregation at the mountain with a mighty voice out of fire and the dense clouds. He inscribed them on two tablets of stone, which he gave to me. When you heard the voice out of the darkness while the mountain was ablaze with fire, you came up to me, all your tribal heads and elders and said, Adonai her God has just shown us his majestic presence. And we have heard his voice out of the fire. We have seen this day that man may live through God, though God has spoken to him. Let us not die then, for this fearsome fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of Adonai, our God, any longer, we shall die. For what mortal ever heard the voice of the living God speak out of the fire as we did and live? You go closer and hear all that Adonai, our God, says. And then you tell us everything that Adonai, our God, tells you, and we will willingly do it. Adonai heard the plea that you made to me and said to me, I have heard the plea that this people made to you. They did well to speak thus. May they always be of such mind to revere me and follow all my commandments, that it may go well with them and with their children forever. Go, say to them, return to your tents. But you remain here with me, and I will give you the whole instruction, the laws and the rules that you shall impart to them, from them for them to observe in the land that I'm going, that I'm giving them to possess. Be careful then to do as Adonai your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Follow only the path that Hashem has enjoined upon you, so that you may thrive, and that it may go well with you and that you may long endure in the land you are to possess. Thank you, Jay. And Deborah, would you like to read a little bit at the very beginning of chapter six? Yes, thank you. And then, and, and this is the instruction, the laws and the rules that Adonai your God has commanded me to impart to you, to be observed in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy so that you, your children, and your children's children may revere Adonai your God and follow as long as you live all God's laws and commandments that I enjoin upon you to the end that you may long endure. Obey, O Israel, willingly and faithfully that it may go well with you 
and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey. As Adonai, the God of your fathers, spoke to you, Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God, the God alone. You shall love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Take to heart these instructions with which I charge you this day. Impress them upon your children. Recite them when you stay at home and when you are away when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them serve as a symbol on your forehead. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. When Adonai your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to assign to you great and flourishing cities that you did not build, Houses full of good things that you did not fill. Hewn cisterns that you did not hew. Vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And you eat your fill. Take heed that you do not forget Adonai, who freed you from the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. Revere only Adonai your God, and worship God alone and swear only by God's name. Do not follow other gods, any gods of the people about you. For Adonai, your God in your midst is an impassioned God, lest the anger of the Lord your God blaze forth against you and he, and God wipes you off the face of the earth. Thank you, thank you so much, Eric. Richard, would you like to read a little bit? We're at verse 16. Yes, thank you, Eli. Do not try the Lord your God as you did at Massah. Be sure to keep the commandments, exhortations, and laws which the Lord your God has enjoined upon you. Do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you and your fathers, and that your enemy may be driven out before you, as the Lord has spoken when in time to come your son asks what mean the exhortations laws and rules which the lord our god has enjoined upon us you shall say to your son we were slaves to pharaoh in egypt and the lord freed us from egypt with a mighty hand the lord wrought before our eyes marvelous and destructive signs and portents in egypt against pharaoh and all his household and us he freed from there that he might command us to observe all these laws to revere the Lord our God for our lasting good and for our survival as is now the case it will be therefore to our merit before the Lord our God to observe faithfully this whole instruction as he had commanded us thank you we're now at the very start of chapter 7 when Adonai your God brings you to the land that you are about to enter and possess, and God dislodges many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations much larger than you, and Adonai your God delivers them to you and you defeat them, you must doom them to destruction. Grant them no terms and give them no quarter. You shall not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your children away from me to worship other gods, and God's anger will blaze forth against you, and God will promptly wipe you out. Instead, this is what you shall do to them. You shall tear down their altars, smash their pillars, cut down their sacred posts, and consign their images to the fire. For you are people consecrated to Adonai your God, and of all the peoples on the earth, Adonai your God chose you to be God's treasured people. It is not because you are the most numerous of people that Adonai set God's heart on you and chose you. Indeed, you are the smallest of peoples. But it was because Adonai favored you and kept the oath God made to your ancestors that God freed you with a mighty hand and rescued you from the house of bondage from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that only Adonai your God is God. 
the steadfast God who keeps God's covenant faithfully to the thousandth generation of those who love God and keep God's commandments, but who instantly requites with destruction those who reject God, never slow with those who reject God, but requiting them instantly. Therefore, observe faithfully the instruction, the laws and rules with which I charge you today. And that's our entire Torah portion for the week. Thank you all very much for participating in the reading. If you have a copy of the study sheet, I invite you to, to take it out. Uh, and I've entitled uh, this week's study sheet, uh, Nothing from Something. And we'll, as we work our way through our study sheet and look at our work of art, I hope it becomes clear uh, what I intended with the title of this week's study sheet. So I begin the study sheet with the very opening of our Torah portion from chapter 3, verse 23, and which from which we get the, the name of our Torah portion, Ve'et Hanan. So Ve'et Hanan, which is translated here as I pleaded, uh, the verb uh, Et Hanan comes from the uh, the Hebrew verb Hanan, which means to, to show favor, uh, and in the Hebrew grammar, it's in what's known as the heat palel form of the verb, which means it's a reflexive form of the verb. That is, the subject is, is doing an action to the subject self. So in that sense, um, the subject of the verb and the object of the verb are essentially the same. So what does that mean in this case? There's something in, in, that intrigued me about that, that Moses starts off here by saying that he pleaded with God, but because it's in the reflexive form, it is, it is an action that he's doing to himself. So I want to explore a little bit more about why this Torah portion opens up with uh, something that Moses says, I did this. It is a, an expression of some kind of complaint, but it is also in the grammatical form of the verb, something he's doing to himself. So we'll see how all that kind of plays out. One of the uh, dominant themes of this week's Torah portion is the notion of no images. And, and it said a number of times that you saw no shape at, at Mount Sinai. And there are these divine instructions that are repeated several times that we are to make no sculptured image. So the importance of what happened at that climactic moment at Mount Sinai was an experience that involved no shape that was seen, no image that was seen, and that consequently, perhaps as a corollary to that, we shall make no shapes, uh, no images that are uh, become objects uh, of worship. We know, of course, that uh, this was one of the the failings of the Israelites at Mount Sinai when they crafted uh, the golden calf. Uh, and so we're going to explore a little bit more about this notion of what do images have to do what, with this? Why is it something that's to be avoided? What is the nature of idolatry? And in his lovely book, uh, Rabbi Lawrence Kushner wrote, well, God was in this place and I did not know it. He has a little section on idolatry. And what he says about idolatry is that the, the idolater imagines that there is some kind of divine ego that is accessible to human manipulation. And, and he, he, he says this, he says, idolaters infiltrate heaven and remake God into their own image. So essentially what Rabbi Krishna is suggesting is that idolatry, rather than being the worship of something outside of oneself, is actually a worshiping of oneself. We'll explore that too as we, we go deeper into the material and, and into our painting. And then we have another expression of the I-ness in our portion, and that is in chapter 5, verse 5, where Moses says, describing what happened at Mount Sinai, he says, I stood between God and you. In other words, he's, he's there on the surface of the text is saying, look, I was an interlocutor. I, I was a mediator between you and God because you were too afraid to speak directly to God. You were too afraid 
to really absorb the powerful combustion that was coming forth from God. So I intermediated uh, between you. Uh, the Hasidic master, uh, Menachem Mendel of Kutz, who becomes known as the Kutzker Rebbe, uh, says this, he, he intentionally misreads the, the Hebrew here, and he reads it as the I stands between you and God. And then in a more, in a more contemporary uh, Kabbalistic reading by uh, Mordechai HaKohen, who was in, uh, in a 20, mid 20th century, a rabbi in Jerusalem, kind of expands in more contemporary language his understanding of what Menachem Mendel of Kotz uh, was saying. And he wrote, your ego stands between you and God. Normally, not even an iron barrier can separate Israel from God, but self-love, egotism will drive them apart. So we have <clears throat> this notion within the spiritual tradition of Judaism, that which is expressed through Kabbalah and Hasidism in particular, is that uh, this notion about God being a, an identifiable character uh, actually is a construct of ours. And, and the Zohar itself, um, in its description of the opening verses uh, to the book of Genesis, um, describes that, says that the way to read the opening verse of Genesis is to read it that there is something ineffable, an ineffable force creates the entire universe, including God, that God is not the generator of existence, but is one of those elements that is created. <clears throat> and so a lot of what Kabbalah and Hasidism tries to do is tries to get us away from this notion that, uh, that God is some kind of essentialized character. <clears throat> um, and, and great rabbi, contemporary rabbi Arthur Green says uh, says this it says yud hey vav hey is a verb that has been artificially arrested in motion and made to function as a noun so he's returning us to the notion that that the true essence the true nature of what we call god is this verb not this noun and a verb as we know is something that is is in motion something that is an action rather than something that has been stabilized and contained and become static like, like a noun. And we have in the book of Job, this lovely quote, <clears throat> wisdom comes forth from nothing, ayan. And indeed, ayan is one of those words that Kabbalah will pick up trying to describe and give some kind of word to that which we think of as God. Uh, sometimes it'll use the expression ein sof, that which has no end, that which is nothing, or merely ayan, that which is nothing. And so this, this erasure, if you will, uh, of a image that has boundaries to it is one of the great projects of, of this Jewish spiritual tradition. And out of that, we get uh, this bit of wisdom from the Hasidic tradition. That's a number six on our study sheet. It is a great achievement to make something out of nothing. Even greater is to make nothing out of something. The goal of a spiritual life is to rearrange the word ani, which means I, which is spelled aleph nun yud, into ayan, nothing, which is spelled Aleph Yud Nun, for the ego to dissolve into the undifferentiated nothing. That I'd like to take a look at our uh, painting uh, for this week. It's a painting by Robert Rauschenberg, painting that he did when he was relatively young, about uh, 26 or so, uh, during one of his times of studying at Black Mountain uh, in, in North Carolina, <clears throat> which was a center for a lot of some of the more modern progressive uh, uh, artists 
of the time in the mid uh, 20th, 20th century. And what he did was he took uh, uh, several canvases during this one summer at Black Mountain, and he, he painted them all in pure white. Uh, and he painted them uh, different panels. Some had uh, one, some had two, some had three, some had five, some had, and this one has seven panels to it. And each panel you can see there in this one is uh, perfectly uh, proportionate to each one of the others. The, the, the brush stroke is virtually invisible. Uh, you can't tell any kind of, ref any kind of uh, gesture or, or human hand in, in the, in the paint brush uh, stroke it, itself. And it, uh, it created quite a stir and, and he was quite enthused by this uh, particular painting. And uh, immediately after doing it, he wrote uh, to Betty Parson, who is a, a gallerist, uh, about the work in a letter. And in the letter to Betty Parsons, he wrote, that his uh, white paintings, as they came to be known, they are not art because they take you to a place in painting art has not been. They are large white, one white as one God, canvases organized and selected with experiences of time and presented with the suspense, excitement and body of an organic silence, the restriction and freedom of absence, the plastic, fullness of nothing. The point of a circle begins to end. It is completely irrelevant that I am making them. Today is their creator. Here in this letter, he is in fact kind of erasing his own, his own uh, authorship uh, of this painting and says, today is their creator, not I. And uh, the following year, he actually invited a, a number of friends, artists, to come and uh, and re uh, refigure, redo these these paintings, uh, which kind of then further diffused his his own authorship of these paintings. So they were spread out over a number of artists, and then uh, about ten years later, when they were going to be exhibited at the at the Castelli Gallery in New York in 1968, he actually handed off to one of his studio assistants the the the, the job of refabricating all these uh, paintings for the display. So further receding, if you will, from the role of being the artist uh, of of these particular paintings. One of the people who was uh, also involved in Black Mountain was the um, composer John Cage. And John Cage, uh, the following summer, 1952, took a number of the Rauschenberg's white paintings and had them as a, a background, a decor uh, for a musical piece that he wrote. He was inspired by what Rauschenberg had, did, had done. And then also that same summer, uh, John Cage composed a piece known as Four 433. 433 is a, a three movement musical piece that has actually no musical notes in it. Mm -hmm. It is a, a piece that he composed with, has a rather detailed instructions for a musician uh, to come onto the stage, uh, prepare an instrument. Originally it was a piano. In, in later performances, it was different instruments. And after preparing the instrument, the musician would just sit on a chair and there would be silence for four minutes and 33 seconds. And the notion that John Cage was playing with is that uh, the silence itself, the silence itself that he was creating by creating this framework of pulling everyone together, having a musician on stage, and then intentionally not performing any musical notes, that there was other things to be heard beyond which, besides what he himself as a poser, as a composer, uh, could, could present. So both uh, uh, Cage and, and Rauschenberg 
here are engaging in this notion that it's important to get beyond what seems to be the, the sculpted image, whether it is a visual image or an oral, an oral image, uh, that if we can get beyond that and get beyond actually our own authorship of all of these things that are presented, uh, we can get into a, a deeper level. And in a sense, it's a way of these artists erasing or trying to get beyond their own ego in, impression upon uh, the works of art. So I, when I pull all those things together, uh, one of the things I, I see happening here in, in this week's tour portion is this important lesson that Torah is trying to teach uh, the people of Israel as they are getting ready to cross over into the promise. Uh, and that is what is uh, the wisdom that comes out of the Hasidic tradition that we have on our page here. It's, it's really amazing to make something out of nothing. And indeed, that is, that is what God did in Genesis. There was nothing, and then there was a lot of things. And so that was amazing to create something out of nothing. And the job of the human being is to then reverse that process, to try and take all this stuff and then see beyond it and see that the source of everything is what we should aspire to, the nothingness. So with that, I, I'd love to uh, hear what you saw, what you heard, as we're kind of exploring this notion that in order to really uh, take hold of the promise that the divine has presented to us, it's important to get beyond our ego self. So with that, Jay, I'd love to hear from you, and then Rose, and then others who may want to raise their hand. Go ahead, Jay. Thank you, Rabbi. Um... I had to get beyond the um, superficial humor of what uh, John Cage did and uh, really give it some thought. The other thing is that I heard this week, um, I believe during a discussion, maybe at Temple Israel about Tisha B'Av, I found another definition of uh, what lay across that Moses could see it was rather than the promised land, it was the land of promise. And I've been pondering that different translation. That's yeah. all. No, I, I appreciate that. It, actually, in a lot of uh, our discussions and, and writings that I share with you, I often use that, that uh, phrase, the land of promise, because uh, that way, it uh, de-emphasizes the land aspect of it. Uh, it de-emphasizes the geography. It de-emphasizes uh, the materiality of, of what's, and instead it emphasizes the, the spirituality aspect of it, the promise uh, of becoming more fulfilled uh, and of having a sense of home, uh, not only materially, but having a sense of home within oneself. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, let me call upon Rose. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, first of all, I posted something about being in nothingness from a different tradition in the chat. I'll let you guys oh. take a look at it. Race ipsa loquitur. Um, what I'll take away from this Parsha is, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis about saying, you know, don't worship uh, other gods but I think more importantly it's saying don't worship me your god I mean the question is still there whether he's the only god I mean I think that this is an ongoing question don't make idols and things like this because that limits your imagination of me because by making me into an idol, making me into a finite thing, is limiting your imagination. And I think that that's what Hashem is saying here, is don't limit your, your imagination by just trying to pin me down or pin anything down, pin the universe down into one aspect. 
because that will make you less. That will make everything that makes the world for you less. So, you know, he's kind of saying, dream big, think big. Don't, you know, don't fence me in, I guess you could say. You know, and I think that that's what he's saying. He's not saying, well, I'm going to pound on your head if you start worshiping God, uh, other idols. I think Hashem is saying, don't, you know, do yourself a favor. Don't try to make your worship or your concepts or your thought limited. Right. And I thank you so much for bringing that uh, to the table, Rose. And what you're also pointing us towards is that God is saying this, uh, not just be about God's self, you know, don't worship me this way, but what you said about limiting your imagination is that th this is a message also about uh, this is how you are to treat all of creation. Right. Because I am imbued in all of creation. So you don't treat another person uh, in, in an, an essentialized way. Realize that the person before you is also a verb, is also in a, is also a dynamic happening, not merely something that is, can be essentialized and, and, and contained within just a, 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 a single notion so that we were all in the process of becoming. So all this material here about uh, describing God is, is meant to also instruct us about how we are to look at others and, and all that exists within creation. So thank you for, for bringing that to the table. Richard. Yeah. Yes, I want to think back on that to say that uh, this business of being free, it's not being free to do whatever you want. And one of the definitions of freedom is being freed from your ego's greeds and your ego's desires. And that to not have an idol outside yourself that you pray to or seek power from, because that source is already implanted through you to the root of the tree of knowledge, whatever. It's there and can come through the nothingness which you are. And you can manifest God's commands without even thinking about it because you're in tune or you've absorbed enough of that power by freeing yourself from your ego's desires to then act in the world in an appropriate way. And, it, it, you know, this the message that we're getting is, uh, we've talked about this before, uh, that there is no biblical Hebrew word that means obey, and that the closest that we get is the word that we encountered here. Uh, and, uh, and, and Deborah was the one who read for us uh, the Shema, you know, Shema Yisrael. Uh, that very precious verse that's so central uh, to the Jewish faith. And so it is Shema, which is, means that one is to be attentive, attuned to something that is, uh, is vibrational and, and that it is full of motion, it is full of dynamic, it is full of tension. And, and it, referring not only to to God, but to as Rose was pointing us in the direction of uh, is true for each one of us. The true of the person in front of us, the person in front of us is dynamic and and full of vibrations, and that the universe itself is full of vibrations, and and that's what we need to be attuned to, and and. Uh, be aware of the constant dynamics and developments that are happening and the possibility. And as Jay was pointing out, the land of promise, the promise is not just that there'll be a rich and fertile, gro fertile ground in which to, to graze our herds and grow our food. Uh, the promise is that we can always become something more than we are at any given moment.
and that we have the capacity to, to grow and develop. And that is a, a radical, radical notion, especially emerging out of a, of a hierarchical ancient society where people thought that whatever status they were born into, that's what they would remain. And this is a, this is a message that says the promises, the promises, if you live a certain way, you can grow far beyond uh, your your current state of being. So, uh, others who might want to share, Margo. Uh, yes, going to the text, you know, the rabbis have, uh, had many theories on why Moses was not allowed into the Jordan. But, you know, God never tells him why. He, he just says, you're not going to. And in the very first, the very first that we read tonight, it said, but the Lord was wrathful me, with me on your account. And I'm wondering if as a man, he was a man, he must have wondered why, came up with maybe reasons, but maybe part of it was an admonition to, or, or uh, because of you, and I've had to lose my temper gosh knows how many times during this journey that I think if, if he's not sticking it to them a little bit, that it's because of you that I'm not going to be up. Yeah. We, we've, we, last week we, we mentioned about how this is a Moses retelling the story. Yeah. Yeah. And we mentioned at that time, some of the retelling is not going to be quite so accurate. And oh. Sometimes that's what happens at different stages in our lives. The way we remember things is not the way things happened objectively. Yeah. Uh, but for some reason, uh, we are remembering in a certain way. And if we can figure out why we're remembering that. So Kira, what's happening here is that Moses seems to forget that it was that moment when he struck the rock when he was just supposed to speak to it. Yeah, uh, but he struck the rock because of the pressure of the people around him being water so I, I think that he was sticking it to them a little bit okay. but, faith. yeah he was uh, Richard here just said he lost faith he lost faith yeah. so let, me, let, let me invite Robert uh, to share as well thank you Marga well, thank you again for another uh, lovely evening it's always so enjoyable and Rose thank you for uh, taking the time to put something in the chat it's Appreciate it. You know, I think there are many ways to understand um, what we've read, depending on our understandings. But there is one thing that I, I think we can all center on that um, we can live and aspire to. And that is in Deuteronomy 5 21, where it is said, Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife. Neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, battery fully charged, or his maidservant, or his manservant. <laughs> the third time I've made that mistake, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. And it just points out, I think this is akin to uh, what you were sharing and what we've been thinking. If we can see it, it's illusion. It isn't real. This is another way of saying as I understand it, what's real is inside. Love is real, kindness is real, faith is real, compassion is real. These are sources of wealth. Nobody can take those away from us. But the things on the outside are such a delusion. And when we talked about attachment and nothingness, it is so easy to value someone based on what they have, based on their stuff, instead of the stuff of what they are. When I lived in the West Indies many years ago, my favorite companion was Anderson. And when he read a prayer, it just take you to heaven. And he's someone who suffered. He was probably around 40. He was a school teacher, had a nervous breakdown. He'd start out with an eloquent sentence and then it'd go drift off somewhere into nothing. And his skill at painting was about like a second grader, if that good. 
children used to mock him. He was my favorite companion because I loved his spirit. And he said to me once, I, I may have shared this in the last couple of years, but he said to me once as we were walking and children mocked him. And I thought this was such a wonderful example of striving as a human being and being a man. He said, I know they make fun of me, but I'm a man, I still have to try. That's essentially what he said. And I, when I remember him, it's with great fondness. He had nothing. He lived literally in a shack. They threw him out. He had to find another shack. Somebody made the mistake of giving him a guitar. And of course that, was, that was the end. He didn't know how to make music. So those, that's my thinking, you know, can we rise above and just see a person's heart? Just see their goodness, see the beauty in them. See the kindness, the tenderness, the courage, true wealth. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank beautiful. you again for a lovely evening. Beautiful words. Thank you. And, and let me call upon Richard here again. I just have one more quick thing that goes back to the beginning uh, about being afraid uh, and about being afraid. And at this time, you're talking about going to services in the park. Uh, and maybe the answer there is to uh, having faith. That somehow faith figures in. And I figure, what am I afraid of? Well, I'm afraid of the loss of democracy. So I keep, try to keep the faith and turn on the love uh, vibrations. And I think that this chapter is about that, about the people this Israel in the story here is a wave of not individuals, but a wave of consciousness trying to find a way with guidelines to have a community where it's where it's where love is the transaction. And whether that's possible or not, I don't know, but it certainly is worth trying. So uh, to bring together so many of the points that, that people so beautifully raised, uh, the capacity to create uh, something from nothing is, is certainly something that, that we're all familiar with. We, we all work, we may build things, create things, uh, things that were never there before. But it, to be able to create nothing from something that is to begin to, to share and to surrender our hold on things requires a, a community that uh, cares for one another, has empathy for one another, trusts one another. Uh, and that seems to be what our task here is on earth, is to create that kind of nothing from something. Uh, and, and if we do that, that's probably what I think what the promise, the land of promise is, is all about. That's what a, a land that flows with milk and honey is all about. That's what it means when in the Genesis, it says that a river flows of, from Eden. It, it is an ongoing flow. Uh, and if we are able to live in a way within our hearts uh, that does not believe that everything is a zero-sum game. Uh, if we're able to live not as Cain lived uh, with his brother, which is, you present a threat to me, and therefore I, I have to eliminate you. Uh, but if we can create the kind of community where we're able to have that level of compassion and sharing trust and love for one another, that is the, the human dimension of nothing from something. And that will certainly be a reflection of the spiritual path that we're all on. So I want to thank each and every one of you for helping to create uh, that kind of community uh, among us, where we feel that level of trust and compassion and caring uh, with one another. Uh, and this nothing is really quite something. God bless you all. I'll see you all uh, next time. Be well, everyone. God bless you. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see y'all. <laughs>